In this video, we'll look at a few more related rates problems and think about a few more tips that you might keep in mind as you try to tackle some of these problems yourself. We've seen the warning before that you should not substitute transient information before taking the derivative with respect to time. However, you should substitute constant quantities before taking the derivative with respect to time. Suppose we had a rigid ladder and the top of the ladder slides down the side of a building. And suppose the base of the ladder moves away from the building at a constant speed of 0.5 feet per second. Find the rate at which the top of the ladder is falling when it is 5 feet above the ground. We'll give some names to the sides and the hypotenuse. And now we'll try to translate all this information into succinct mathematical notation. Now, we're told that the, it's a rigid ladder and the length is 13 feet. What does that mean? It means z is always equal to 13. Or put another way, z is a constant function of t. In terms of the language we've been using for related rates problems, z equals 13 is not a transient fact. It's actually a persistent fact. It's always true. z is always 13. So we could use the relationship x squared plus y squared equals z squared, but that would be a little too much. We don't need z in there as a variable because z is always 13. What we should really do is use the expression x squared plus y squared equals 13 squared. That's what we should use. It's legitimate because it's true at all times. So if we take the derivative of both sides of this, we will get a legitimate relationship between the related rates. And so the derivative of a constant is 0. So the right-hand side is 0. And the left-hand side, we use implicit differentiation carefully to obtain 2x dx dt plus 2y dy dt. Simplify. And there we have our relationship for the derivative. Now, we're told that the base of the ladder moves away from the building at a constant speed of 0.5 feet per second. In other words, dx dt is 0.5. We wish to find the rate at which the top of the ladder is falling when it's 5 feet above the ground. In other words, we want to figure out what dy dt is when y is 5. At the moment in question, we can substitute 5 for y and 0.5 for dx dt. And we're still missing one bit of data. What is x at this moment? But when y equals 5, we can substitute into the Pythagorean identity to find that x is 12. So from here, it's a matter of simple arithmetic. And we discover that dy dt is negative 6 fifths feet per second, or negative 1.2 feet per second. Here's another tip. Have a strategy. Look for the most direct and graceful way to relate the relevant quantities. Suppose a rocket is being launched, and it's being tracked by a radar dish on the ground. As the rocket ascends, the dish is going to swivel to keep pace. Now suppose a tracking dish is 500 meters from the launch pad. 10 seconds into the launch, the rocket is 800 meters in the air and rising at a speed of 160 meters per second. At that same moment, at what rate is the angle of the tracking dish changing? Let's call that angle theta and give names to the sides of the triangle. We just saw the tip that we should substitute constant data if we can find it. And we know that the tracking dish is always going to be 500 meters from the launch pad. So let's replace that x with a 500. Now, there are a lot of different relationships you could find in this triangle. And if you're willing to bring in area and perimeter, you could find some more. It's a rather bewildering collection of facts. And you could just start writing them down and taking derivatives and trying to hack through a problem. But maybe it would be better to take a step back and think about what you're trying to accomplish. We're trying to find the rate at which the angle is changing. In other words, we're trying to find d theta dt. One of the key facts we have in the problem is that the moment in question, the rocket is rising at a speed of 160 meters per second. In other words, dy dt is 160. It looks like we should be searching for a relationship between dy dt and d theta dt. Of course, the easiest way to do that would be to find a relationship between y and theta. There's a pretty clear one. 
the tangent of theta is equal to y over 500. Now, it is true that the sine of theta is equal to y over z. That relates theta and y as well. But that's not so great because we're introducing a new variable z into the picture, and it's really not so obvious from the statement where z even shows up at all. Let's go with the first one because that's the most direct way to relate y and theta. Now it's time to take the derivative. We know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and we gotta use the chain rule because theta is a function of t. So that derivative of the left-hand side should be secant squared theta d theta dt. And we need to take the derivative of the right side. Now, you might think we should use the quotient rule, but I hope you sort of recoil in horror at that thought because that's overkill. We don't need the quotient rule for this. The way to think about this is y over 500 is really 1 over 500 times y. That's a constant, that 1 over 500. So it can slide out of the differentiation process, and that derivative is just 1 over 500 times dy dt. So here's our equation that relates the rates of change. Now at the moment in question, dy dt is 160. We can clean this up a bit and recall that secant theta is 1 over cosine. And if we multiply cosine squared theta on both sides, we come up with this nice relationship. d theta dt equals 8 25ths cosine squared of theta. So where are we? We're just missing the value of cosine theta. So the question is, when y is 800, what is cosine theta? If we could answer that question, we'd be pretty much done. We know that cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so it's equal to 500 over z, and now it looks like in the end we actually do need to work with the hypotenuse z. We need to figure out the value of z when y is 800. Now we could hammer through this using the Pythagorean identity right here, the way this triangle is drawn, but let's be shrewd about this. We've got nice even numbers here, 800 and 500. What we could do is we could scale down by dividing through by 100 to get this nice small triangle with sides 5 and 8. Now we can find the hypotenuse in our head practically. So 8 squared is 64, 5 squared is 25. So what we're really looking for here, the hypotenuse in this little triangle is the square root of 89. Now we can scale back up to figure out that the hypotenuse of the original triangle is 100 times square root of 89. But you know what? Actually, what we need is already encoded in this little triangle. We're looking for cosine theta. These two triangles are similar. Theta is the same, and cosine of theta can be read right off this triangle. It's actually 5 over square root of 89, which is exactly what you'd get on the right side but we're sparing ourselves a smidgen of arithmetic, and in more complicated problems, this kind of observation might really pay off. In any event, cosine theta is 5 over square root of 89, and so the square of that is 25 89 Now we can clean up our expression for d theta dt, and we find out that the angle's changing at a rate of about 0.09 radians per second. By the way, when you're doing calculus, on trig functions, you should be measuring angles in radians. Any kind of result like this, taking derivatives, the, everything should be expressed in radians. And then if you really want it, you should translate into degrees. So in this case, you could multiply by 180 over pi to find out that the dish is swiveling at an angular rate of 5.15 degrees per second. Here's our last tip in the video. It is possible, and sometimes preferable, to work with more than one relationship. Let's suppose the area of a circle expands at a constant rate of 10 square inches per minute. At what rate is the circumference of the circle changing when the radius equals 12 inches? So let's give some names to quantities. Let A be the area, let C be the circumference, and let R be the radius. We're supposed to be finding the rate at which circumference changes with respect to time when the radius is 12. In other words, we'd like to find dc dt when r equals 12. Now we know that the area is expanding at a constant rate of 10, so dA dt is 10. 
We want a relationship between dc dt and da dt. Now there are two obvious relationships that should pop into your mind. The area is pi r squared and the circumference is 2 pi r. We could relate c and a directly by solving the second equation for r and then substituting it back into the equation for a to obtain this relationship. We could clean that up a bit and we find that the area is equal to 1 over 4 pi times c squared. We could take the derivative from there and continue. That's perfectly fine. That's a great way to do this problem and it'll lead you to the right answer. However, let's go back and think about this in a different way. It's not going to be such a time saver for this problem, but it does introduce an idea that could really pay off in a more complicated problem. What we're going to do is we're going to use both of these relationships simultaneously. So dc dt would be 2 pi dr dt, and da dt would be 2 pi r dr dt. Please check that you agree that this is what you get when you use implicit differentiation with respect to time. Now, these two expressions are awfully close. They're so close. It's just that the top expression is lacking a factor of r. So what we'll do is we will mul multiply both sides of that top equation by r. Now these two expressions are identical. And by the transitive property, these two quantities are equal. So dA dt is equal to r times dc dt. Now what's nice about this is it's one equation that combines the rates of change of a and c and the radius r, and all of these show up in the problem. So dc dt would be 1 over r dA dt. And when r equals 12, we've got all the information we need to plug in. And we discover that dc dt is 5, 6, or about 0.833 inches per second. Let's summarize these three new tips. First, if a quantity is a constant function of time, substitute it before taking the derivative. Second, find the most direct and graceful relationship between the relevant quantities. Think about your strategy before you launch into your calculations. And third, be willing to use more than one relationship if it yields simpler calculations.